Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 175 of the Stroke Cast Tone and Spasticity After Stroke with Dr. Wayne Feng. This episode is brought to you by the fine folks at Modus Nova. To find out if Modus Nova can help you recover the use of a stroke-affected limb, visit strokecast.com slash Modus Nova. I first met Dr. Wayne Feng through the National Institutes of Health StrokeNet Advisory Council, which is a group that helps researchers refine and conduct their research. Uh, he is a researcher and a clinician in stroke care at Duke University, and he joins me today to share his expert insight into post-stroke tone and spasticity. We'll get into some more detailed medical terminology in this episode, including where we'll define tone and spasticity, although if you're impacted by tone and spasticity, you probably already know what it is. But we are going to talk about things like peripheral versus cortical issues. So I wanted to find some of that stuff up front. A peripheral issue is physical damage to the limb. A cortical issue is something that happens in the brain. So, for example, the paralysis that comes from stroke is a cortical issue. It's because of damage in the brain. However, long-term damage to a limb, for example, if your fingernails keep digging into the palm of your hand, or you have significant shoulder subluxation where the arm just sort of falls out of the uh, shoulder joint, that's considered a peripheral issue. Peripheral refers to the limb itself. Cortical refers to the neurologic issues that can impact our bodies and our minds. We also talk a lot about flexors and extensors. Flexors are the muscles that, you know, flex a limb. For example, when we go ahead and flex our arms to show off our muscles, our bicep is the muscle that bends our arm at the elbow. It's a flexor. To straighten our arm, we use our triceps. Those are the muscles on the back of our arm that help pull our arm straight by extending the arm. Those muscles are extensors. Tone and spasticity are usually caused by flexors going ahead and doing their own thing, just firing off and contracting when the extensors are not. We, we talk about that in greater detail, and if you want more details than that, be sure to check out the show notes in your app or over at strokecast.com slash tone basics. So now, let's meet Dr. Wayne Fang. So, Dr. Fang, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm sorry, Bill. Thanks for reminding me. We talk a lot in the community about tone and spasticity, and we de we deal with that all the time. I I deal with it. Most folks with some mobility challenges after stroke deal with it. But tone and spasticity, it gets lumped in almost as a single word. Uh, I, so what is tone and spasticity, and what is the difference between tone and spasticity? That's an excellent question. You know, spasticity, if we really use a simple way, basically, abnormal increased tone, okay? Does we need a tone? Yes. The tone cannot be too low, cannot be too high. If it's too low, you can't able to move too high. You also cannot have a good quality movement. So abnormal increased muscular tone, that means spasticity. But they don't come come by itself. Typically come with a motor impairment. So patient cannot move, that tone is high. In the very beginning, also associated with pain. So three things. So pain and uh, spasticity and uh, motor impairment, hemiparesis, hemiplegia. So those are three hallmark of a symptom with spasticity. And then it's not just stroke, it's any you know, acquired brain injury and you can have a have a spasticity, such as you know, multiple sclerosis, TBI, and a cerebral palsy, any acquired brain injury, and they 
they can all have a spasticity. It's interesting how we see that across our neuro cousins, the uh, the MS community, the CP community, the mm-hmm. all, all these different uh, the the TBI and uh, concussion community. All these have uh, different manifestations of the the same symptoms. So the when when my fist won't open, it's because mm-hmm. there's too much spasticity and spasticity is then just another name for having way too much tone in those flexors for lack of a better term yes so it's basically abnormal increase of tone with your flexor uh it's not extensive it's a flexor um and uh, uh that's majority of a patient have ischemic stroke they have a you know overactivity of their flexor and muscular tone. Uh, other diseases may, may also have a, you know, extensive and a spasticity as well, but it's not very common. And you can also have a, you can also have a cold contraction. Basically, you have abnormal tone with both flexor and extensor. Uh, but in stroke, particularly ischemic stroke, um, it's predominantly just uh, the flexor and the spasticity or flexor. Oh, uh, you know, muscular tone. It's much more common, as you say, to have the flexors, which, for example, will bend my fi- my fingers into my fist, yeah. or mm-hmm. will contract my bicep to bring my arm in, as opposed to the extensors, which open up the finger, open up the the fist, or the triceps, which extend the arm out. Is exactly. And, the, and you also have a pronation and supination, but the pronation is almost a flexor, and the supination is almost a... Pronation is like a flexor, supinator is like an extensor, because most patients also have a pronation, pronator, and a spasticity. So the arm kind of, kind of pronator. Mm. And it come to leg, it's, they are internal rotated. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. The pr- pronation yeah. is how you rotate your your hand down so your knuckles are up on top. Yeah. Supination yeah. is when you go the other way. Exactly. So why does it affect the flexors so much more than the extensors? There are a few hypotheses probably. Um, and, and, and so what, you know, first let's say what causes spasticity. You know, we have few hypotheses. We're almost getting there. Number one, definitely the corticospinal tract got disconnected. What is a corticospinal tract? That's a major con- that that's a major pathway and a connect the, the brain or the motor cortex with your limb, means the arm or legs. The cortex is always it's a helical. It's always inhibit. So once you the con- the connector got it disrupt means the cortex cannot control in the, the downstream and so the downstream all those those neurons they got over activated and or they got disinhibit because because now they can't inhibit so now they go crazy doing all kind of thing and one one track called lubin spinal track and they got over activated and that seems to have more innovation with the flexor less to the extensor. So that's why the flexor get overactivated, the tones tones are higher. So I hope that kind of makes sense. Because it's almost like the default in the body is for the flexors to be active and to curl up and to bring everything in. And so much of the time what the brain is doing is it's overriding that default to give us sort of normal movement. And then in the case of stroke, the brain is no longer able to override that natural yes. behavior. Yes, you, you got it. Yeah. It's fascinating how the body does that. So obviously there are a lot of challenges around living with tone and spasticity. It gets in the way of therapy, of teaching the brain how to work with those extensors again, because the flexors are just so loud. Yeah. But so, so let's talk about the spectrum of treatment options, because there are a lot of different ways of treating this. Let's first work on how to prevent first. So how do we do that? 
Um, so the specific come at you two parts. One is we just talk of the brain part. The other part is actually due to misposition. Let's say, well, you, you don't move the arm, of course. You, you know, your tendon gonna stiff, right? Your joints gonna stiff. Your muscles gonna contract. So if you don't stretch, well, you have a show, now you can't move, but you can still pass and move. If you don't move, and of course, the peripheral also, you know, so the component also adds up. So first is brain issue, second the peripheral issue. In the end, it's brain and peripheral issue. In the end, a lot of patients get a contracture, and that's too late. I have a lot of patients, a lot of patients, young patients, basically, we really have to control the spasticity to preserve the arm in the best and natural condition as we can. Then 10 years later, you might be able to benefit from some new treatment. Otherwise, the contracture is not, a, it's, it's, it's beyond a brain issue, brain essential issue. It's joints, it's a fatty tissue, it's, it's muscle, it's joints. So that's the, the end stage of a specificity called a contracture. And we really don't want to have this happen. Okay. So how we can prevent this? There's a few things we can prevent it. Um, well, number one is, you know, have more therapy to restore the connection. Once you restore the connection, the brain gonna, again, the motor cortex gonna control, then downstream will be suppress those tone, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one. Number two, slow stretch. You may not be, for some of those severe impaired patients, well, you can't really overcome the brain part because it just the brain is so severe injury. But you can do passive movement. You can overcome the peripheral part. So you can minimize, you can prevent some degree. You can, you can downside from severe spasticity to moderate, or maybe from moderate to moderate spasticity. One of the things I find myself doing in a lot of just the conference calls I'm on for work, slightly out of camera range, is I'm always busy sort of trying to stretch my fingers back and stretch, stretch my wrist back just as sort of just one of those things you do to fidget Yeah, as an example. Yeah. yeah. So you basically, this moment is maintain what you have to prevent this spasticity getting worse. But a lot of those prevention should be instituted in the very beginning. And then, and you also delay it because most of spasticity started happen by a month. But if you're active doing some therapy, doing this, you could also delay the spasticity or minimize the spasticity. You know, um, but we are not there yet. A lot of time we neglect the spasticity in the first place. Not only the patient, even the scientific community, they also neglect the spasticity. There's a lot of disagreement on the spasticity. Uh, if you talk to some physical therapy, they probably tell you don't treat the spasticity. Um, and they, that, that's not quite right, in my view. Yeah, they would say, oh, you treat it, or pa patient gonna have fall, we need the tone. That's true. We do need some tone, as I said in the beginning. Tone cannot be high, cannot be low, but you gotta treat the excess of tone. So active stretch will be helped. There's some medication you can use in a, and and knowing predict the patient can develop a spasticity, you may be proactively to start some medicine. Some of those are called a muscle relaxant, you know, such as uh, baclofen, tizanatine. Uh, those are central muscle relaxant. Or you can even choose some uh, peripheral, flexoril, carbapentin. Those all can help with the decrease of the muscular tone, you know. And then you can add this low stretch, you know, and then you can minimize, prevent some of the spasticity. The oral baclofen is actually uh, part of my treatment regimen. I, I take that. One of the challenges with that some people experience with the oral baclofen is that it can also drive uh, fatigue and sleepiness. In my experience, and of course everybody's experience is different, talk to your own doctor about the right medication that might help, is I find that taking it at night is useful because I'm already want to sleep. And secondly, reducing tone and spasticity at night helps me sleep better. Exactly. And, you know, at least, uh, you know, the eight hours you sleep, 
you know, your muscles are completely relaxed. Your tendons are loose, your muscles are loose, you know, your joints are loose. At least you have eight hours really completely loose, right? Exactly. Otherwise, you know, so medication, I think you just need a, some med- some people re- respond to one medicine is a little better. In general, always start low dose, mm-hmm. you know, but sometimes it's a physician, you know, they don't have much of, they just start a big dose and, and not all the patient, you know, they can figure out and, uh, you know, right away, you know. Exactly. Um, so start a nice, start a low dose, you know, and then start to gradually develop some tolerance with the medication. Then you can jump on to, to twice a day or three times a day, and then the dose can be increased. It's a slow process, you know. But a lot of time, and, and patient big, expect a big effect, and <laughs> doctor just not impatient. Okay, four milligrams, four times a day. Yeah, no. <laughs> that will be set things up. And, and and back. Right. And that's one, one reason why it's so important to have a really good physiatrist as part yes. of your medical team. Yeah. Physiatrist is, of course, a rehab yeah. doctor. So what about splinting? I know uh, different yes. occupational therapists feel differently about putting people in hand splints or wrist splints. Absolutely. So splint is basically just constant stretch. I like to use those softer splint they should use it. And what it does is really, you know, basically stretch the flexors, give the extensor a little bit of break. And then people was interested in the field is, okay, use the sprint at night. No, you do in the day as well. Sleep actually is naturally and you know, reduce the tone. Why is that? We don't know. But Bill, if you pay a little attention, once you go to sleep, your arm will gain loose. The first thing you wake it up, drink a coffee, stand up. That's when the tone start activated. Exactly. One of the things that's really interesting too is just the way the body's own automatic responses impact that. For example, yawning is one of those things that was so that my my girlfriend loved watching me yawn yeah. about two months after my stroke because suddenly my my affected Yo. side would like go full jazz hands and my fingers yes. would open up wide and, yeah. and stuff yeah yeah so that's called a yawn phenomena yawn effect so now the yawning for some reason and it briefly suppressed the subcortical and a pathway so the brain transit take a little control so and then you actually able to move your arm and give you sometime create some and a force positive and then so that oh my arms move um, there are people actually um, figure out how use a yang effect to suppress some of the subcortical and a pathway not only yawning you actually also can do auditorial response just just like this you're scared, and they, they will suppress. Yeah, huh. yeah. Fascinating. We're gonna have to look. We're gonna have to dive deeper into that uh, that yeah. stuff in the future. Um, so we're continuing to talk about some of these different uh, different things. Another thing that I do less often these days than I used to. We're probably on about six to eight month cycles now. Are, are medications like Dysport and Botox to treat tone mm-hmm. and spasticity? How, how how does that help? Remember, it's a, the flexor is got to overactivate too much tone, so the muscles contract all the time. Whether the Botox or this board actually has another called Zeman, and those are you know um, those are toxins. So what it does is it basically inhibit the muscle contracts, so reduce the tone. So now the flexor cannot move or less likely to move. So basically give a little break for the extensor. And so with the therapy, and then so, you know, it will strengthen the, the, the flexor. So once you extensor getting a little bit strong, they, they will be against the flexor. But the medication lasts about eight to 10 weeks. So they need to repair the kind of injection. So it's really work on the peripheral part, although there are some data also suggesting, you know, 
even blocks the muscle, but it actually has some sensual effect as well. And I think likely they could have a sensual effect. So, um, and then, but it doesn't, you know, it's really reduced muscular tone, but it doesn't strengthen the, you know, the brain, the arm, the connections. So my feeling is, you know, you know, it, 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 you, you gotta do the Botox, you got, in, you know, and at the same time, you have to strengthen the connection between between the brain, the middle cortex, and the arm and leg. I think that that's the key. Once the brain is in control, and then I think then you know then the spasticity will naturally go down. Then you may ask the question: What about the what about the connection with the severe damage? Um, and those patients can be very tough uh, to to very interesting. I don't know if you feel you. You you know you read this and published on Uruguayan Journal of Medicine called C7 Nerve Transfer. Very very interesting paper. You know when when the brain due to a stroke, let's say your left side brain and connect with the right side of the arm, the connection was completely destroyed. But now they use the nerve and wrap it on the neck and get a transfer. So now your right side of the brain and control the both arm. Now the connection restore because you transfer a nerve. The tone just miraculous just decrease because now the brain's in control. Hmm. Uh, so I think Botox is one way, but it's not the only way. It should be, you know, should be used with other other therapy. We are not there yet, um, but uh, it, it works uh, for some patients. Yeah. Right. Well, I think what's what's really interesting about it is what we already know about stroke rehab and recovery is that you have to do those tens of thousands of repetitions in order to help drive the plasticity of the brain to establish yeah. those new pathways and new connections. Mm -hmm. With uh, too much tone and spasticity, for example, in the biceps, curling the arm up, the extensors don't get the opportunity to do any reps. Once you can apply Botox or Dysport yeah. or these other medications to the bicep, now the tricep has the option of actually getting in a few of those repetitions so the brain can start establishing that other connection. It gives us an opportunity to potentially recover. Yep. Yep. So, so we talked a little bit about oral baclofen. We're getting into uh, some more intense experiences here now and, and leading it up. So let's let's talk about some more aggressive uh or, or I don't want to say extreme in this case, but what about the surgical option of intrathecal baclofen? Intrathecal baclofen basically is just give, give the baclofen on the spinal cord. Very little medicine, just hundredth of, one percent of those you're taking, you put over there. Right upon on the pathway, again, Bill, we talk about those subcortical pathway. One in the brain stems, the other one is where the so it's a spinal cord level, so the medication can suppress, and then and then, and it, it's one way to to uh, to uh, help reduce the spasticity, but it is a it is a surgical procedure, uh, it's expensive, yeah. Yeah. Well, it it's interesting because normally we don't always think about we think when we take a pill, it. You know, there's this perception that if you have a headache and you take a pill, the pill goes to the headache and and, and treats it. But yeah. of course it doesn't. When you take a pill, it's got to go into your stomach, in the digestive system, into the circulation system, go all around until maybe a little bit of it gets to where it needs to be treated. treated. And when you talk mm -hmm. about surgically implanting something like baclofen, now you're sending just the tiny bit of medicine, as you said, just to that one spot where it needs to be which also reduces your side effects. You you describe very well. Yeah. The only thing is that it's it's a you know, it's invasive procedures, it's expensive and you you also um also be really careful and then because now you just have the medication work on your spinal cord. Um and it's very low dose, it's very easy it can be overdose. Or if you don't forget, uh, if you forget and you know, refill the pump and then you, you 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 know and the tone can can go up a very go go up again very quickly yeah so so it it's not something for every patient obviously but for those with some severe 
tone and specificity, uh, it it can be a solution. Absolutely, and I recommend you get a little bit early before you develop a contractor. Yeah. And once you develop a contractor, it's not a brain issue; it's a peripheral issue. Uh, but certainly, if you develop a severe specificity very early, and if a good insurance and talk to the provider, I recommend you get a little bit early. Yeah. So once you've developed a contractor. Or if your tone spasticity is especially severe, because I mean, if you've got strong enough uh, flexors in your fist that are just pulling that in there, and yeah. now you're talking about doing other damage to the limb, you're talking about driving your fingers into the palm of your hand. I know yeah. of a couple of people who have gone to the extreme end of actually medical amputation. Um, actually, you shouldn't do the med- uh, amputation. It's not. It's not. Not something I recommend. But there are other procedures you can do: selective neuroectomy, or you can do tendon release. Means you cut some of the tendons. But eventually, you know, the muscle tone spasticity causes muscle contraction. You know, then you release some of the tendon and cut some of the tendon that will help. Or you just do the neuroectomy, basically, and you go to spinal cord in a section, you go there and cut a little bit of nerve, select to cut some of the nerves, and that will also reduce the tone. Uh, but it's those are, you know, those are invasive procedures and, and they can reverse the process and really, really to reserve as a last resort. But I am seeing worse because if you can't can open, you have diabetes, you don't clean the hand. It's very easy to get a get an infection, gangrene. You know, you can lose your hand. Yeah, so there's a lot of and bad complication secondary to to severe spasticity. And those procedures, like when you're talking about cutting the tendons, the reason that works is that, you know, ultimately our muscles are all about moving our skeleton and our bones in different places. Mm-hmm. They do that by the muscles attached to the tendons, the tendons attached to the bones, the muscles pull, that pulls on the tendon, that pulls the, yeah. the hand itself in. If you yeah. cut those tendons, now that muscle is no longer connected to that, so it can't pull that fist in. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes they also do tendon release, basically, you know, that kind of help them, but, uh, you know, it's a last resort in my view. Right, right, because yeah. you can't undo that. And we yeah. talk about how recovery is still possible, even with thousands yeah. of repetitions. But once you've yeah. cut, physically cut the connection between the limb and the rest of the body, mm-hmm. you, you, that that's no longer a brain thing that can be repaired by just repetition. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating to explore all these different options. And again, anybody who's living with tone and spasticity, uh, first of all, if you are new to stroke world, keep moving and keep stretching to try and prevent it. If you are now living with tone and spasticity, talk to your physiatrist or your doctors about different treatment options so that you can uh, deal with that tone and spasticity and then ultimately deal with potentially getting use of that limb back as part of your day-to-day life. Absolutely. Absolutely. You should have figured a way to preserve your arm condition the best you can. Even if your arm cannot move, but at least you have a close to normal muscular tone. And then, you know, as science advances every year, and one day we may have a new therapy so you can benefit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So much amazing yeah. stuff coming out and be sure to check with your medical providers about any studies that may be available that you may qualify for uh, to potentially participate in and advance the science and make some of these m- other therapies potentially available to, if not yourself, then thousands of people uh, in the future. Absolutely. Dr. Fang, if, if folks want to know more about you and what you're up to, where should they go? I'm at the Duke University School of Medicine. I direct the stroke program at the, at the Duke. Um, we have very aggressive uh, and acute treatment program. We also have one, a few programs in the country called Eye Stroke. Um, that's called a BFAST, the EPAR. Not a place to actually treat an eye stroke. 
Um, but we treat eye stroke. Last year we had 49 eye stroke patients treated at Duke. Uh, we have to save some divisions. We also have a stroke recovery clinic run by me. I do Botox injections. I do provide a consult. Uh, and uh, something even just to provide a hope to, to some of the patient. If you want to find me, then just uh, uh, look at me, Wayne Fan. MD Duke and that should be pop out. My email is wayne.fen, F-E-N-G at duke.edu. Very easy. Uh, so folks, if you want to email me, um, you know, uh, feel free and yeah, please do. Uh, my research is all about brain stimulation, stroke recovery. Um, I use electro stimulation, ultrasound stimulation, magnet stimulation, laser stimulation, basically light stimulation. Uh, we zap the brain, we, you know, we utilize your resilience and uh, to help them uh, and better or just elevate their function to one more step. So that's about me. Fantastic. And we'll have links to those uh, in the show notes and over at uh, strokecast.com. And you mentioned uh, the vagus nerve stimulation. Uh, we're not talking about trips to Nevada to do that. To do that. We're, uh, it, it's some really interesting work that's been happening on there. Uh, about a year ago, we yes. featured uh, Dr. Jesse Dawson talking about some of the, the testing showing that the implant stimulating the vagus nerve was able to drive more effective physical therapy and uh, and and really some fascinating recovery. So we'll have links back to that interview as well. Really interesting to see that, that stuff happening. And that brings us to our hack of the week. But first, let's talk about sponsor Modus Nova. Modus Nova helps stroke survivors get use back in a stroke-affected limb. The AI-controlled, air-powered robotic exoskeleton actually just sort of fits on my affected arm, and it helps me move my hand and wrist as I play video games. It also resists my movement as I start to get better to make sure that I actually do the hard work. It adjusts the assistance or resistance for the user based on, well, how well they use it. When I don't want to think about what I'm doing, I'll, I'll choose games where the Moda's hand mainly helps me stretch. The main benefit, of course, comes from actively doing the exercises and getting in the thousands of repetitions needed to drive recovery, but it is nice to have those options in there. To find out if Modus Nova can help you recover the use of a stroke-affected limb, visit strokecast.com slash Modus Nova. Use promo code STROKECAST to save 10% off your first month. And now back to our hack of the week. I like to use a hand grip exerciser. These are those things that look kind of like a pair of pliers or, or tongs that don't have a tool at the end. You grip the two uh, sides of it to try and bring them together and close your hand on it and just squeeze it. What I like about them is that in addition to giving me the exercise I need of squeezing that in my hand, they also help release my hand because that spring in there is actually pushing against my fist to try and open it up. So I'm getting my, I'm getting to exercise my fingers, my flexors. Uh, when I relax a little bit, it helps stretch out uh, my muscles a little bit more and gives my extensors a chance to engage. So it's really a great way to go ahead and try practicing with those different muscles, especially since the first thing that tends to come back in the hand is the flexors, the ability to make a fist. A lot of times uh, in rehab, and of course everybody is different, what will happen is you'll have one day where suddenly you start to get enough finger control back to close that hand into a fist. It may be weak, may be strong. Over time it can get stronger, but it's a lot harder to go ahead and then open things up again. These hand exercisers help you do both of them. And the other thing I like about them is that they're quiet, they make no noise, they're unobtrusive, so I can actually use one while I am on conference calls or other phone calls, just sort of out of camera view as I'm just squeezing this thing and then relaxing to try and open up and get a few more repetitions in on my hand and fingers. 
I'm going to go ahead and link to a couple of different options over uh, in the show notes at stripcast.com slash tone basics. You'll, you'll, you'll see some Amazon links over there, but you can find them pretty much all over the place. Start with uh, the uh, lighter weight ones, the ones with lower tension, uh, because, well, that's probably what you need in the affected hand. And then as those become too easy to use, you can always move on up to ones that have higher tension. But again, you can find those links over in strokecast.com slash tone basics. Now, if you still have a few minutes, I would appreciate it if you could help me out and do me a favor here. Uh, please go ahead and visit strokecast.com slash survey and complete the listener survey that's over there. It's going to help me do more of the things that you like on this show and fewer of the things that you don't like on this show. Uh, we ask about the types of guests you want to hear from. And really, I just want to collect any input that you have so I can continue to make sure I am providing as much value as possible in this show. Uh, and if you complete the survey by March 31st, 2023, you could even win a $25 Amazon gift card. So go ahead and check out the survey at struckcast.com slash survey to complete it and to learn more. We did cover a lot of fairly technical stuff in this relatively short episode. The most important takeaway is that if you experience tone and spasticity, make sure you do your stretches. I know OT and PT are always on us to do our stretches and do our exercises, but this stuff matters. Doing those stretches and continuing to stretch and exercise is how you can reduce your chances of having a contracture or permanent damage in a peripheral issue in your hand. Do those stretches, do those exercises so that as your brain rebuilds those connections, it still has a great limb that it can connect to. I'd also encourage you to explore some of the different uh, medical treatments and options that are available with your uh, with your medical team, whether that's going to be medications like baclofen or a, an implantable baclofen pump or uh, Botox or Dysport or some of the more advanced surgical treatments. Be sure to go ahead and, and, and ask about those options to find what's right for you. Go ahead and also ask other members of our community, of the stroke community, about their experiences, too, so that you'll have even more knowledgeable conversations with your doctor and medical team because you'll have done some research and have had plenty of other conversations. So, again, do your stretches. Talk to folks. Talk to your doctors. Find what's going to work best for you in the long term. To learn more about these tools and the terms we've used, check out the show notes over at strokecast.com slash tone basics. Be sure to share this episode with someone you know by giving them the link strokecast.com slash tone basics. Please also complete the Strokecast listener survey over at strokecast.com slash survey. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you soon. The Stroke Cast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Strokecast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network.